Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashwet, and I'm a security scientist at H2O. Well, um, I think the first question might be, what's a security scientist doing at H2O? Um, and the answer to that is, we are, we are actually trying to build things above the basic stack of H2O itself. And that's where um, you know, more in the business applications come into the picture. And this fits in one of the micro app architecture. So what are the few problems that we look at when it comes to network security? Um, malicious threats you know, from the insiders, from the external people. Um, we have distributed denial of service attacks. We have uh, data loss. Um, and we also have user behavioral analytics. And um, you have to understand that most of the network security field is very paranoid, so they run with rule-based algorithms. They don't want to miss out any single incidents, so which is one of the reasons they try to refrain themselves from using machine learning for their algorithms. And that is something I'm actually here to change. So what we see here is we use rule-based algorithms. We have a lot of experts you know, who analyze data, who tell us what is right and what is wrong. Um, and they investigate different kinds of situations. And then they come back and say whether something was positive or something was not. Now, how can we change that? that that's actually our big question. One of the, some of the reasons that we need to change this is because um, it actually takes time, and it's, the process is slow. But it is still justified because we don't want to miss any of the incidences that might have happened, as I said earlier. Um, so let's see. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to look at this use case. And um, so I'll be speaking about two use cases out here. And that will actually give you a perspective of how we are trying to fit in machine learning in the process. So again, um, one of the things is the consumption of time, um, large amount of manpower is required, and the process is very slow. Um, and this kind of is a problem when you have lots of data that is coming from different security incidences, because um, you actually have to go through all this in a short period of time and come back and say whether an incident was actually right or wrong, or did it actually happen, or was it a false positive? And, um, there are very limited number of people in this field, frankly. There are a lot of professionals who operate on data, but there are a lot of limited number of people who can actually understand every incident in this field. And that's where, um, th that's where the whole machine learning process actually comes into the system. Um, so a simple difference, uh, most of the people assume that security, um, identifying behavior in the field of network security is just identifying outliers. Um, it's not exactly the same thing. So most of what we do is identifying anomalous behavior. And anomalous behavior does not have a precedence. Usually it does not have a precedence. It could be a behavior that exists you know, within your normal behavior. It could be a behavior that exists um, you know, with the outlier. It could be anywhere across the chart. But it's not exactly identifiable. But outlier, although low, with Although it has very low probability, it does exist. And that's the basic difference between um, outliers and anomalies you know, when we look at network security incidences. Um, so identifying anomalous behaviors are actually quite difficult. You, you have to actually model your data in, in a way that you can identify um, these behaviors. So how do we go about doing this? What you do is you first create something called as a context. And the context is the primary idea under which you can identify different kinds of behaviors. So what a context is is an actual scope or a framework under which you start analyzing your data. So let's take a simple example of you know, um, people coming through tunnels you know, in a gate. Now, if you were to see someone um, who is not expected to come into a building, but if, uh, if the person happens to be walking in, how would you identify that that person actually walked in, was not allowed in the building. And, and that's where you create a context. It's like, what time did he come in? Did he come in on a holiday? You know, it, it, it looks very much like a rule-based system, but that itself is very flexible, and I'll tell you why very soon. Um, it, it, so as I say, it, it's very rule-based, but it looks very rule-based, rather. But you do use the same system to make this effort. 
So what do you do is, let, so uh, as I was talking about it, let's take a simple example here. I know there's a lot of text, but I'll take you through this very quickly. Um, so let's assume that you have, the use case that you're working on is a Windows login use case, where you have users logging in, all you have is their login time, their successful login times. Now, could we identify which user is actually malicious or which user is not? And so to do that, we actually have to create a context. And the context goes such. So with Windows, there are different kinds of users. You have system users, you have administrators, and you have uh, you know, actual systems, um, system accounts which, which perform different kinds of things. Now, that itself starts, it gives you the idea of how you separate your data. The moment you start separating your data based on the kind of users, the data you're analyzing for these different groups is actually going to be different. The next thing that you do is Windows logon actually happens in different kinds. So you have physical logons, you have uh, you know, network-based logons, you also have um, remote logons, and you have terminal-based logons. So that, too, adds to the context that you create. Now, interactions between these two, interactions between users and interactions between uh, these different kinds of logons actually creates the context that you want to identify and recognize what is, what, which part of the behavior is anomalous. And these interactions are what we study. So here, if you see, this is, um, this, this is one, of, one of the use cases that we were working on very early on is the Windows use case, uh, trying to identify anomalous behavior. And here, if you see, you just see, very simply, you see three clusters. Uh, this, is very, um, this is very early on in our work that we did. So here, when, when we break the data down, we see um, a, this is actually an administrative user. That's a system user. And the final one is, um, you know, sorry, um, system accounts. So each of, this, each of these data blobs, or you want to say clusters, um, actually give us the concept of the context that, that I'm speaking about. Um, you divide the data in a certain way, and then you analyze the data in that family or in that context. And if, if you were to add the type of logins as well on top of this, you would see that the data would further divide itself by forming different clusters within this, small, within this uh, three different user groups. Now, so what is the problem with this? is that with all the algorithms that we develop, with everything that we do, we can only predict to a certain extent that a certain login was actually malicious, or could be malicious. We can't say with 100% accuracy that um, it is actually malicious. And that is a problem. Because what we, are telling, what we are telling the business users is that we do not exactly know that this is bad or not. We just can predict with a certain amount of probability that this is bad. And that's not a good thing, specifically when you're dealing with security people, because they want to know if an incident actually happened or not. And for this, we actually use, um, so if I go back to the slides. Sorry, yeah, right here. So as I spoke here, we speak about experts and professionals. So for the, for the prior for we use these experts and professionals to help us out here in terms of understanding the data. What, um, let's skip forward again. Yeah. So here what we do is we use them. We actually shortlist the data that they need to analyze. We use their, their help to understand different processes uh, that are actually valid to be identified as malicious and the ones that are not. And with their investigation, we actually get to know whether uh, something that we had identified was malicious or was it just a false thing, a false positive. <clears throat> and um, so we have... Um, So most of the work that these people do, um, if, if I just go back to the words that I said, there is a case that your context can actually, your context are actually very flexible in the sense that you, could, you can change your context, you could modify it, and this primarily happens when different families that you have identified in which you're building context um, can, actually be, uh, can actually be homogenous. So some of them, for example, like a user when he, lo when, when he logs on you know, remotely or through a network system, um, 
could behave in a similar way. So you could merge those two contexts and make them look one. Um, you could have different thresholds for different contexts. So that tells us that a certain behavior is necessarily normal in one context, but it is not normal in another one. So that helps us identify. The, um, so using this process of you know, uh, supervision from uh, the experts, it actually helps us understand how, how do we vary these parameters and how do we come to a conclusion. Um, so this um, is one of the consoles that we're actually using um, as an information system for the experts and the professionals. So what we provide here is we provide them information about um, different things that we feel uh, needs to be alerted for them. We identify different um, situations and we say, hey, here's an alert, here's a situation that's actually happening. Can you, you know, investigate and find us out and, and help us more about this? So this um, is, is actually a system that um, Tony's team, I think Tony's right there. Yeah, Tony's team is designing for us. Um, so that's something that might be interesting to look at. So where does this lead us to? Um, so, the, so after we've done the whole supervision process, um, one of the ways that uh, one of the spots that we actually end up with is, as I said earlier, lots of data. We have multiple logs, and we have lots of data that we need to analyze and build in some kind of a correlation. And that correlation is actually very important for us, primarily because most of this data that exists, most of the log data that actually comes out, um, don't usually um, are not usually strong enough for you to identify behaviors um, independently. So when you correlate them, usually across time, um, you, you, can figure out, um, you, know, you, you, you can figure out what kind of an event is happening. And um, that actually helps you identify incidences even better. So let, I'll give you an example in this case. So let's say you had um, a user login. OK? Um, and, I'm, and I'm going again with the login, but this is a slightly different use case. Let's say you had a user login, which started off with multiple fails, and then um, you had one successful login. Then the, lo the machine that this user connects to um, the attempts to connect to a database server. OK? And then um, you see that there is a request made for the data to be dumped out of the machine. And then the data gets moved back into the machine. Now, if you were to look at these, Events in, in, if you were to look at these events individually, then you would see multiple login attempts and one final successful login. We all do that. Everyone forgets the password, you know, every 180 days. We forget our password, we get a new one, we try our old password, never works, but we get in finally. That's the usual incident. The next thing that you see is the connection to a database. I mean, we all work with data, so connection to a database is normal. It's not a big deal. Um, and then the data dump. So let's say you, you're creating a new table. You're just moving the data to a new table. Perfectly fine. But, and you're also drawing the data down from, you know, from your database to your local machine. Um, I'm sure quite a few of us do that, provided it's not sensitive data, while we are trying to analyze data. Now, if you were to look at these incidences separately, you would see that there is nothing wrong in it. Everything is fine. But when you put all of them together, that is when it actually starts to make sense. That is when you actually realize that, oh, this is an attack. This is probably an attack. And that is what we are actually trying to get to, is that we are trying to create this kind of an intelligence, which, is, which we are able to capture and say, if you were to look at all these logs, if you were to look at all this information that comes by in, in such a way that you, know, you can figure out what is happening on your network, then you are, you, you're pretty sure of identifying a malicious incident that might actually happen on your network. And, and that's, that, that, that's exactly what we are actually going at and trying to design with it. Um, so what do we learn here? So as I said earlier, you know, anomalies are not, uh, your anomalous behavior can be very well embedded in your natural behavior. Now, one of the things is correlation helps us identify these anomalous behaviors. We, we, using, using these kind of log event correlation, we figure out that we can identify these kind of behaviors by observing a certain behavior that uh, the combination of these events in this larger context, and that's when we figure out that, 
oh, this is actually anomalous. And that is the primary need, and that's the primary way an anomalous behavior is actually identified. Um, it's not just, you know, outlier detection is what I want to say again. Um, so in my, uh, you know, just, just trying to summarize the whole thing as to what I've spoken right now is, what are we trying to find here? I mean, we're trying to identify the right context to identify anomalous behavior. And one of the reasons anomalous behavior is interesting because most of the hacks that we see these days are not necessarily you know, the ones that people have tried. It's not those kind of people you know, who take a script, run it on the computer, and see if they connect to your machine and download whatever they want. No, it's, um, it, it's organized people you know, who are well-funded, who know how to break into your machines, um, and who do it very quietly and really well, I must say. Um, so, and you know, identifying how we can correlate logs, that's another important thing that we've learned. Um, and if you can transform anomalous behavior into some kind of statistical model, you know, you can identify it, that's a good thing. And you also have the blessings from the experts. So, that adds value to it as well. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, th this is probably quite descriptive as to, you know, what I wanted to say. I do want to thank everyone who's come by, you know, um, all the support people and the open source members of H2O, and our H2O people itself, and finally our clients. Um, really appreciate everyone. Thanks for making this happen. Uh, and before I close, these are the three people I work with. Uh, this is Mark Chan. Uh, he's literally a ninja. Um, this is Ivy. She's the one who designs our um, you know, interface, and that's Fonda. She's the one who helps us understand um, you know, our entire requirements and stuff like that. So I want to thank the entire team out here. And that's it. Any questions, anything at all, that would be great. Thanks.